we have three intelligences, the gut intelligence, the heart intelligence, and the mind intelligence. What connects all three intelligences? You know, there's so much that is written about and talked about now with the breath work, but there's so many secrets, so many gems in that, as well as sound therapy, vibration therapy, voice. It's also understanding that there is the somatic part of the body. So it's not just talk therapy. Talk therapy alone doesn't work. Where now is it in your body? How now will you release it? Will it be with sound, vibration, tapping? Will it be with Qigong? Will it be movement? Which organs will release those energies? And then of course, I play in the soulmatic, in the spirit world across multiple dimensions, because there's so much more than this 3D world, right? Just because you can't see it, it doesn't mean it is not there. Just because it's not part of your belief system, it does not mean it is not real. When you start to believe it, the stuff that we can see is extraordinary and the different practices that we can make a part of our daily routine and embody so understanding that when I combine the semantic the somatic with the soulmatic time and space folds and results happen very very quickly but in a beautiful space of joy of energy of power of inner peace of playfulness yes there's a certain experience where you do have to walk down that long hall of mirrors but that is looking at yourself and not turning away but going okay I get this now I need to neutralize this now I need to integrate it now because it's all a part of us you know the beauty I see in you is the beauty I see in me the ugliness I see in you is also the ugliness as I see in me and when we can integrate all those parts of ourselves there is nothing in here to trigger anymore whatever triggers us is what needs healing and so if there's nothing here to trigger then we know we're well on our way to have gone down that healing path welcome to the awakening entrepreneur podcast this show is for entrepreneurs they have chosen to define their life beyond the material. They have followed their soul on a hero's journey towards the mystery of the spiritual. I'm your host, Garrett Newman. Each episode will be learning from awakened entrepreneurs and spiritual thought leaders. They have broken through the mold of being ordinary to extraordinary, challenging our paradigm, shining lights to the dark, giving hope when there is doubt. The moment of truth is upon us. It is time to transcend our world from fear to love. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to this week Awakening Entrepreneur Podcast. I have a very, very dear friend, someone that I've known for, I don't know, like 10 plus years. Um, how we've met, I actually know her by reputation from winning various awards and some of the awards I was also being involved with. And in Australia, she is the bomb. Like She is one of the leading female entrepreneurs in the entrepreneurial space in Australia, but also worldwide, she's also got a significant reputation as well. Most people know her by the restaurant. Um, it's the most awarded Vietnamese restaurant in the world called Red Lantern in Sydney, Australia. But she's also won the Telstra Business Woman of the Year, which is like the Uber um, Award for Entrepreneurs in Australia. But I also know her as someone that is an outlier, someone that lives beyond the structural boundaries, the belief system that people say, you need to do this, you need to do that. But not only is she living beyond that, but she challenges with such grace, with such grace that like, if you're doing something because you're following the rules, there's nothing wrong with that. She's not making anyone wrong. I have so much respect for her as a parent, as an entrepreneur, as a human being, as a soul. She's so generous and so giving in helping a lot of people and shining the light on the path on how to build your life as a leader and as an entrepreneur. Recently, she launched her book, um, The Way of the Spiritual Entrepreneur. That I felt I connected to her even more because in the last few years, as you guys know, I'm deep in my spiritual journey and not many people, not many entrepreneurs have been so open about their journey, incorporating spirituality with entrepreneurship. So she has a lot of wisdom. She coaches and mentors people around the world and keynote speaker. She's wonderful with her writing. So without further ado, welcome to my dear friend, Pauline Nguyen. 
Gary, thank you so much for that introduction. I almost cried. <laughs> my good friend, thank you so much. And thank you for having me. It is my joy to be here. Well, I know so much about you. We spent so much time together, but yet because this spirituality stuff, it goes so deep beyond the surface talk of how you're doing, what business that you run. Can you give me some, some sense of where do you think your spiritual journey or the awakening journey began? Uh, it's that uh, question that is more uh, like the flywheel more than anything, right? <laughs> that there's not just one moment, there's several moments that gets that flywheel whooshing faster and faster and faster. If I were to give you an approximate time, it would be when I decided to have my first child. And it was that decision of, okay, Pauline, you can no longer be this same person as a parent. And it's, you know, never underestimate the power of a decision, right? You know, as before then I was partying and, you know, living a very, very naughty life and just the power of a decision being, you know, partying, smoking, drinking, drugs. And then as soon as that decision was planted in my head, I now want to have children. And it was no longer about me. It was no longer about me. And as soon as I made that decision that it was now going to be with someone else, for someone else, literally overnight, I stopped smoking, I stopped partying. And during that time, that is when it really began to no longer be this person and be a more evolved self. Mm, wow. So, so around late 20s, early 30s. Mm. So I guess I'm like almost 50 we, now. Before we go really deep into the spiritual stuff, let's give the audience listening to this a bit of a context. Uh, you became an entrepreneur, but like a lot of the awakening entrepreneur, you didn't have the most pleasant upbringing, right? Uh, no, growing up was shit. Growing up was really, really tough. But we all have a choice. We all have a choice. And uh, look, we are refugees. My father um, smuggled our family after the fall of Saigon. And he and his friends built a boat. And we went out into the South China Sea, spent nine days out at sea. We ended up in Thailand. Uh, we spent a very difficult year in the refugee camp there. And that's when my famous, my rather famous uh, brother Luke was born. He was born in a lean-to tent in the refugee camp. And so my brother, Lewis, who was three, my baby brother, um, Luke, just born and myself, we stayed there for a year. And in 1978, Australia accepted us. So the biggest issue was that my father had so much trauma from the war, from the horrors of the war, so much trauma from the experience at sea, uh, the trauma from, you know, the year of hardship in the refugee camp, and then coming to a new country with nothing and having to support uh, a sick wife. My mother had tuberculosis at the time, uh, two very young children and a newborn. And he suffered terribly from PTSD and ultimately he had nowhere to dump his anger. And so he dumped it on my mother and then us kids. So growing up was tough, really tough. A lot of emotional, physical, mental, spiritual abuse for us growing up. But um, I can tell that story now without the charge because it's no longer me anymore, right? I tell the story in service of others. And I look back at that now and I see that as my training. Mm -hmm. Pain is inevitable, right? But suffering is a choice. Mm. How old were you when you're in the uh, refugee camp? I was three. My brother Lewis was two. When we came to Australia, I was four and he was three. Wow. Yeah, it must be difficult because even coming out, I hear a lot of stories of the Thai pirates and robbing whatever little possession you have and rape and other stories as well. So I imagine that there must be like a lot of things that went through your dad's um, head. Yeah. We were the lucky ones, Gary. We were the lucky ones. What do I mean by that? I'm, uh, my father made the decision that anything would be better than the camps where they would literally uh, brainwash all the soldiers. And so anything was better than that. We were the lucky ones because he had that vision. We were the, the part of the first wave that escaped early before the pirates caught wind of the bounty that was going to be at sea. And my first book, Secrets of the Red Lantern, I did a lot of research while writing that. And a lot of our fellow country men and women uh, weren't as lucky as we were. So many horror stories of being uh, raped and pillaged, pirate ship after pirate ship after pirate ship until there was nothing left to take. 
Wow, who set the bounty for the Thai pirates? That was the bounty. The incredible、oh. number, the sheer number of people that were out at sea.、Mm, got it. Wow, I was just reading a book. Like, even though there's a lot of things that we can point the finger to say that it is not right with our current society, but in terms of like the number of deaths by violence has significantly gone down like over the years. So I think we're still living in a rather fortunate time. So, what would you call the、um, the characteristics of the gifts that you got from the discipline? Even though there's a lot of early traumas with scars that came with it, at the back end of it, when you came out, that made you stronger. What were some of those gifts, and what were some of the hindrance at the same time as well? Uh, I think. <laughs> how do we know it was meant to happen? Because it fucking happened. <laughs>、um, I started working when I was seven. My father was quite the entrepreneur. I literally was working full time when I was seven. My brother Lewis started working when he was six. Luke started working when he was about four.、Uh, my father opened a restaurant in Cabramatta. That's what we were known for. But before that, he opened a video library. And the blockbuster releases at the time were all the Vietnam War movies like Full Metal Jacket, Born on the Fourth of July, Platoon, Good Morning Vietnam, and I was like, "Why a video library, Dad?" And he'd be like, "Asians love action movies, right?" And so we、uh, manned the video library. And then after that, he opened、uh, the restaurant, and so we worked in the restaurant. Um, he opened Cabramatta's very first cafe.、Um, we were Cabramatta's very first baristas, so we learned how to make really good coffee.、Um, you know the art of the froth. And then he decided to open an ice cream parlor at the front, selling、um, natural ice cream. And so we learned how to make natural ice cream from the best. And the biggest lessons was work ethic. All of us had a ferocious work ethic.、Um, otherwise, we were literally beaten up. If we didn't perform, the second was this incredible sense of mastery. Everything was mastery. The beef noodle soup constantly tweaked to be better, to be better, to be better. There was no fixed recipe. It was an ever evolving, ever perfecting recipe.、Um, as with, for example, the natural fruit ice cream, it had to be exquisite fruit. Constant evolution of the recipes.、Um, the texture had to be right, even to the point where the ice cream cones. He wouldn't just get the regular ones. We literally had to make hand make. Waffle cones, <laughs>、oh. and and that was a really difficult to get it in the iron pan and then roll it around the mold, and even with the cappuccino froth and the coffee. So there was incredible sense of mastery even at a young age, but most definitely the sense of work ethic, but also never resting on our laurels, right? Never resting on the laurels, and this incredible sense of pain tolerance. One of the hindrances that is now we compensate for, right? Because whatever values we hold now come about because it fills a certain void.、Um, growing up, I was muted. Growing up, I was centered. We weren't allowed to express ourselves. We had to be mute and work hard. And so we were high achievers. It was literally beaten into us. And that sense of okay, so because I wasn't allowed to express myself as a young child, somewhere along the line, I compensated for that. And so now I write and I communicate, and I'm a speaker, and I'm big on self-expression, not being muted or censored. Does that answer your question? Wow, it kind of makes sense now. When I first met you, I can already feel like a sense of strong independence, some sense from you, and that you're not living within the box. Part of those traits, some of them I really admire. Some of them even challenge my own belief system as well. But hearing the backstory, it really makes sense. It just further reinforces,、um, I guess, especially through this spiritual journey, that you can't really judge someone. Who's to say that if you walked every step of that person's shoes, you wouldn't have done the same thing? What are some of the beliefs that were challenging you, Gary? Um, yeah, I think um, it was more so like an energetic thing that you weren't like in my idea of the world. There's this softness to it, and then it's not like you don't have that softness, but it's almost like a force field, like a bubble around you that is like even that when there's softness, a lot of the time there's a shield that's surrounding it. And so it, when it comes to certain conversation, I felt some of the bubble, and it could be my own illusion that, or it is my own judgment of that situation. But at a certain point, I also felt there's some deep mystery behind it, 
because the way that you walked, the way you talked, it wasn't like nine out of ten people, or even forty nine or fifty people. I don't see people that's acting that way, having such a strong sense of self. And that challenged you. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. it, it, yeah, it challenged me to think this is not another person that is just within the box that we're living. There's something like、um, I forgot who said it. Whether you like it or not, there's a level of respect for that demeanor, that that characteristic that shows up. So I have a friend. His name is David Chiem.、Uh, have you heard of David?、Um, no. He owns Mind Champs. No. So you know, as adults, in whether it be early adulthood or later adulthood, we really get a thirst for personal development. And we do the Tony Robbins, and we do all the T. Hub Eckers, all that stuff. And some outgrow it, some stay there. But it's that thirst and that hunger for all that personal development stuff. And so, what he did then was take a lot of those teachings, and understanding that David's background is that he is an actor, a writer, as well as an entrepreneur. He lives in Singapore. He is a childhood friend of mine. We used to do martial arts together. I had two black belts and he did not, so I would beat him up. <laughs> and、uh, anyways, now he's an amazing entrepreneur who wins Entrepreneur of the Year every year in Singapore. And David, if you're listening, maybe give the award to someone else for a change. <laughs> anyway, so David's got, understood this concept, and so he's taken that and he's teaching that to preschoolers. And he has a franchise or a string of、um, childcare centres called Mind Champs, doing amazing things from early early childhood. There's a few in Australia as well. So he flew to Australia to launch my book,、um, The Way of the Spiritual Entrepreneur. And we were having a chat, and he was reading the book, and he said, "Do you know, Pauline, you have the champion mindset?" I was called the champion mind, and I'm like, "What does that actually mean? What do you mean?" He goes, "It's actually a thing." It's a thing, and so in one of his many books called "The Three Mind Revolution: Champion Mind, Creative Mind, and the Learner Mind," right? And so I said, "Can you please tell me more what that is, rather than just saying it? Because it doesn't; those things don't mean anything to me. I'm not praise driven. I'm data driven. What does it actually mean?" So this book was written by David Chiem as well as Brian Caswell. A lot of the studies is from、um, neuroscientist Alan Schneider. And he says you have the champion mindset, the champion mind. And I said, what What does that mean? He says, Well, there are particular traits that all these studies have shown. One of the first is that there is no hesitation whatsoever to express your individuality. There is actually not even any filter or concern for what society will think of you. There's no hesitation. It's the understanding that through your individuality, there are also unique strengths. And the attraction for you is that the unique strengths go against the grain. Anything that go against the grain, whereas a lot of people need to fit in, a lot of people need to have that sense of I need to make the masses happy, I need to conform. Those sorts of words is like physical pain for someone with a champion mind. So whenever there is the masses, or this is where、um, everyone's going, there is a physical pain that actually happens within me, and so I have to go the other way. And the third trait of someone with a champion mind is that we don't really care about the competition. We possibly do live in our own bubble. I know I do, which is why my collaborators、um, that I have in my、uh, various businesses or inner circles, they are there especially because they can tell me、uh, viewpoints that I can't see. It's not my genius, and they give me new voices. And so it is that I don't care who's winning or who's my competition. My greatest competition is myself. So those are the three big factors of a champion mind. So that might also answer your question: of why you experience me the way you do? Yeah, that's that's a. It's great, a thing. <laughs> that's a great answer because, for much of my life,、um, for whatever the reason, I have adopted this、uh, pleaser trait、uh, in order to get love. So when I don't see the same trait in the people I'm observing. Part of it is not within my value system that hey this person is not behaving like me, <laughs> but at the same time that's what is it, still yeah because you're you're、effect. yes thank you Gary we are very different in that respect <laughs> and and I respect you in that respect too. 
So yeah, the next I want to explore is that when you talk about the childhood traumas, that like the charges has been released. How and when did that get released? Was it around the same time that you decided to be a mom? Was it kind of same transition period or was it released periodically? A lot of it happened when I wrote my first book. So when I wrote my first book, Secrets of the Red Lantern, I won Debut Writer of the Year. It did very, very well internationally. My daughter was three or four at the time. And the book publishers pushed me very hard into the book festivals, the writers festivals, um, the speaking realm. And I had said to them, are you going to give me any speaking training? And they said, nope, we just want your raw voice and your raw story. And, you know, it's, it's not that there is no fear. If this is the process, okay, fine. And so I did a whole lot of writers festivals um, overseas in Australia. And as I'm telling my story, Gary, is the trauma started coming up because it was buried for so long. Trauma bonding is not something that I like to do. It's like, well, what for? There's other stuff to talk about. Uh, whereas talking about my own story, that was something that I had to do. And there were moments where I wa- my throat constricted, I was paralyzed, and it wasn't out of fear. It was deeper, much, much deeper. And it was in those moments where I said, okay, something needs to be looked at. And I need to not be like this because I'm in service of no one, least of all myself. The audience doesn't deserve to see me like this. And also the audience doesn't deserve to see me like this. And so uh, that's when I really started doing the work, um, my own work with mentors, with coaches, uh, not only for the trauma, but also for the skill set of being a speaker. That's when I started to walk down the really long hall of mirrors. I feel it's almost like, you're purging the stuff out by having a chance to write about it and talk about it. You're releasing it. And the more that you talk about it, the less it started to have a hold on you. Yeah. The book itself was a cathartic experience. I was integrating it. I never say the stuff doesn't happen and I don't like to block it out. It's not in my DNA. It was, how can I integrate this? How can I use this? And how do we know it, it happened for a reason? What do I do with it? And so a lot of it is for now. I mean, look, I have so many experiences. It's so important for my own congruence that I've lived it, um, that I've had direct experience of it. You know, how many people do we know who just, you know, get it out of the textbook and, you know, people can smell a phony from a mile away. You know, that's not how we do things anymore. Mm. So um, working with different coaches and doing a lot of inner work for other people that's going through resolving some of the, or facing some of the childhood traumas, What are some of the best advice that you can give to them in processing it? I can only speak through my own direct experience. I want to frame it very clearly that I'm not telling people what to do. My own experiences, not only from what I've gone through, but my own experience of how I coach and get results for my clients and it works. I don't make anyone revisit the past. That's old school. That's old school. The past happened so long ago. The past, since then, so many experiences have happened. So many filters have been put on the developmental area. Uh, So many different people have come into our lives. Visiting the past is not even true anymore. It's something that gets evolved and created and often um, exacerbated or emphasized or amplified or even made up, you know. And so I look back at the past to see what are the benefits? What were the benefits? What were the benefits? Just as this whole COVID time, it's like "Mm, crisis doesn't change people. It reveals them. It reveals them. How you do crisis is how you do life. Um, Are you going to look back and be the victim or will you look back and see how you have become the beneficiary of all the things that have happened to you, for you, through you, from you. And this is where the gold is. This is where the real power is. Everything is a negotiation of power. Even looking back at your past, how will you decide to be more powerful from those experiences rather than remaining the victim? And ultimately we decide if your victimhood gives you a sense of certainty and significance because you are addicted 
to the emotions of those past, knock yourself out, man, knock yourself out. But there are different ways of doing things when we've had enough. And in my experience, my own direct experience, as well as my experience of coaching my clients, we don't revisit. We don't go back. We start to redesign. We start to um, uh, create based on our core, of course, but there's no point in looking back. What for? And so life gets really exciting and it's never too late to have had a happy childhood, man, because you can go back from this point forward and create it however the hell you want, be whoever you want to be. That's so much more empowering and exciting, right? But of course, there's a process of integration, not denial, but integration. Mm. So tell us a bit more about the integration. What does that involve? Uh, my processes and my philosophies are very different and also a lot of fun. I practice on the semantics. So as we know, you know, all the, um, the NLP work, the CBT work, the, um, the spiritual NLP work, all the human behavior, psychological stuff um, that we have to have an understanding in. But then also understanding that emotions stories, strengths and weaknesses also get caught in our bodies, in our organs, in our senses. We have uh, three intelligences, the gut intelligence, the heart intelligence, and the mind intelligence. What connects all three intelligences? It's the breath. You know, there's so much that is written about and talked about now with the breath work, but there's so many secrets, so many gems in that. So as well as sound therapy, uh, vibration therapy, voice. And so it's also understanding that there is the somatic part of the body. So it's not just talk therapy. Talk therapy alone doesn't work. Where now is it in your body? How now will you release it? Will it be with sound, vibration, tapping? Um, Will it be with jigong? Will it be movement? Which organs will release those energies? And then, of course, I play in the soulmatic, in the spirit world across multiple dimensions. And in my experience, when I combine the three, the semantic, the somatic, and the soulmatic, because there's so much more than this 3D world, right? Just because you can't see it, it doesn't mean it is not there. Just because it's not part of your belief system, it does not mean it is not real, right? And some people say, I need to see it to believe it. Okay, that's fine. Good for you. But man, when you start to believe it, the stuff that we can see is extraordinary. And the different practices that we can make a part of our daily routine and embody. So understanding that for myself and my clients, when I combine the semantic, the somatic with the soulmatic time and space folds and results happen very, very quickly, but in a beautiful space, a beautiful space of joy, of energy, of power, of inner peace, of playfulness. Yes, there's a certain experience where you do have to walk down that long hall of mirrors, but that is looking at yourself and not turning away, but going, okay, I get this now. I need to neutralize this now. I need to integrate it now because it's all a part of us. You know, the beauty I see in you is the beauty I see in me. (laughs) The ugliness I see in you is also the ugliness I see in me. And so um, understanding, you know, when people get love and light, it's not love and light. It's light and dark, night and shade. And when we can integrate all those parts of ourselves, there is nothing in here to trigger anymore. There's nothing in here to trigger. You know, whatever triggers us is what needs healing. And so if there's nothing here to trigger, um, then we know we're well on our way to have um, gone down that healing path. Wow. I love the various modality that you've used. And when I started learning some of these new tools, even hearing about it, I just think that it's, it's so cool. Like I, but it makes sense, right? Yeah, it, it makes, makes sense. sense. <laughs> like some of the people listening on a podcast may have heard me describe that like my kids started doing like mindful training, so they'd be blindfolded, but yet they can read, they can see things like blindfolded. And before my kids started learning to do it, like I see on the video, my jaws is dropped. And seeing them do it in person, like every time I'm still like in disbelief, like are they really doing it? Are they cheating? Are they seeing through the gaps? <laughs> so um, the three that I haven't heard before, it's, um, or haven't really understood, you said somatic and somatic. Like, can you tell us a bit more on what that is? 
So let me give you again examples. I prefer to speak about examples rather than being too theoretical. I have a client and he's very happy for me to talk about him as a lot of my clients are because they have nothing to hide because there's nothing left to trigger. <laughs> um, uh, his name's Dan and a very, very successful entrepreneur. He read my book. Uh, he holds safari in Kenya and he read my book while he was on safari and he said, she is going to be my next coach. He reached out and it was maybe a week before I was going to give a keynote in Bogota, uh, Colombia. And uh, I said, uh, I live in, I don't live in Kenya. I said, no, he's got businesses in Australia and um, a few properties in Australia. So organized a time where he would come and get coached by me. And we coach at sunrise, uh, literally we meet at first light and we watch the sun rise. There's a whole lot of science behind uh, why I coach at that time. Um, we access nature's medicine. Um, that is part of my shamanic practice. Why do I access nature's medicine? Nature has no agenda. Nature has no agenda. And uh, so many wisdoms and so much power. And when I told him, and then we're going to um, jump in the ocean. It's nature's greatest Faraday cage. And that will trigger you and activate you to actually do the work. And he's like, are you on crack? <laughs> I don't meet you at 5.30 and then spend a few hours with you banging on your drum and talking away. And then we do the breath work and you're going to make me do Qigong. And then I'm going to jump in the freaking ocean. Are you on crack? <laughs> and... Um, the reason why he came to me, he said, I've been seeing a psychotherapist for six years. And I said, how's that working for you? <laughs> and he goes, it's not. And talk therapy alone doesn't work. Or if it does, it takes a long time. It takes a long time. And it's a lot of revisiting rather than redesigning. And so we did the first session and I said, Dan, I just want you to take a snapshot of your current suspicion, <laughs> your current skepticism, the fact that you are uncomfortable with all this work. I want you to take a snapshot because in a few sessions time, your new question will be, what else can I manifest, P? That's going to be your new question. It's not going to be about all this trauma, all this stuff anymore. It's going to be about what else can I freaking manifest? And he's a manifesting machine, manifesting machine. And during this whole COVID time, I mean, oh, you know, before COVID, he's, he can't do safaris anymore, right? Um, and the restaurant industry, man, you know, we all know what's going on there. And he's like, P, in these last three to six months, I have made more profit than I would in two years. And so this is the power that is behind the work when we combine Yep, the semantic, the, the talk therapy, which obviously we need to communicate and a very skillful coach will know what to say, what questions to ask. And then, of course, the somatic work. I got him to release a whole lot of stuff with the breath to get him into a state where he can uh, get into trance much faster. And I have a, a particular breath techniques that I've designed uh, so that everything's just accelerated. Um, my biggest thing, I find neediness repellent. So I would prefer to give my clients all the skills that they need so that they can go and do it themselves rather than having to come back to me all the time. Also, I need variety. And then, of course, the soulmatic work, the shamanic stuff that I do, the energy work that I do as well as having the assistance of nature's medicine and so he healed himself very 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 quickly the beautiful part about Dan is that he does the work every day if you don't do the work you're not going to get the pay right but it's beautiful work and he does it every day because he, by the third session he said feeling good is my new norm hmm. wow that's incredible so I remember like 41 years of my life like doing personal development formal education Nobody taught me about the Ds, like the three Ds, the four Ds, the five Ds. Like, when did you start it to learn or experience it? Uh, Gary, I've looking back, for want of a better term, I was a mystic ever since I was a child. It was never nurtured. And also because growing up, it was all about work, results, work, getting beaten up, <laughs> report, and all that. it was never nurtured. And in conversations with my brothers and uh, looking back, I was able to, um, how can I say, uh, there was a lot of premonitions constantly. We were talking earlier about dreams. 
you know, I'd have dreams where, for example, we bred attack dogs. The kids bred attack dogs because my parents are working all the time. And the dreams were so vivid, you know, to give you two examples, it was, I would wake up and say to my brother, look, one of the rock wheelers today in my dream had got stuck in between the sink and the washing machine. We need to be careful that it does not, you know, churned up if it crawls behind the washing machine. And lo and behold, uh, later that day, we heard a little squeal in the backyard and it was stuck between the sink and the washing machine, exactly as I had visual uh, envisaged it in my dream. And so my brother just picked it up and pulled it back out. And because the dogs were in our care, there was a lot of stuff that was all about the dogs and, and knowing which dog was not going to survive and what we needed to do, as well as this great sense of knowing who was not so much diseased, but diseased as well, who was sad, uh, who was depressed, who wasn't quite right in the head. And the more and more I nurtured it now, the more those uh, gifts are amplified. And so I, looking back, I, I always had it. Uh, these days now I, I nurture it almost every day. Wow, that's incredible. I guess going more from the intellectual side, like more in particular people like Dr. Joe Dispenza, I know that you spend some time with, and not just him, but the scientific community and the ancient times and many different teachers, they all talk about the 3D, 4D, 5D and, and many other Ds. When did you start looking into the various dimension and what do they do? Like, and how did it first come across to you? Because you've always had this inner knowing that in a sense that there's something more. When did you start to put an intellectual framework around it? Uh, obviously heaps of information on the internet with it. Um, to answer your question, I first started questioning it when so much in this 3D world doesn't make sense. And for myself, when things don't make sense, I don't buy into it. I question it and I question it. And then there's ultimately, uh, there's none of this spiritual materialism. You know, it's none of this stuff like, you know, I operate in 7D and above and therefore you 3D people are shit. It's nothing but compassion because everyone is at the level that they are at. Um, we meet them there. It's like with our kids. My daughter now is um, 16. My son is 11. They are both completely different individuals. And my daughter is the typical, the typical gorgeous teenager who is so defiant and rebellious and gorgeous and skillful at the same time. But rather than saying to her, Mia, you're such a 3D humanoid in this 3D world, you know, why can't you be like me? So there's nothing but compassion because she is exactly where she needs to be in her development level. And me as a grown ass woman has to hold her in that space. And there's nothing but compassion to say, you know what, in my early amateur parenting days, thank you for showing me everything that I am not. Show, thank you for that. And they then have been put here to be our greatest teachers. And so we can apply that to, you know, the rest of society and going, oh, that doesn't work. And constant questioning. Why can't I see what they can see? Or why can't they see what I can see? And then with the assistance of um, our mentors, our coaches, our inner circles, as well as the stuff we study, it's like, okay, because we have elevated to the next level of development and the next level of spiritual development and the next level of spiritual development. And then we understand and, and give it, um, they're basically just names for different levels, right? Really. And when you reach a different level with a whole new skill set, you get to see different things and understand different things. It's the pre-conventional, conventional, post-conventional, post and I operate in post-post-conventional um, because I've done the work, I've had great teachers. And so to chuck it down, it is simply how you see the world. Yeah. So um, I love the, the way that our kids, um, I don't know whether I would say use the word love, but there's an element of love, the way that our kids like challenges us and help us grow and see, help us see some of the work that we need to do. And also our intimate partner as well for me in particular. And I think like that's kind of like for me, it was the catalyst for my awakening because despite the amount of personal development stuff that I have learned, when the trigger is there, my reptilian brain will automatically kick in before my logical brain. So all the skills I've learned, I didn't get to apply it prior. So that's when I got onto breath work and working on the midbrain and other spiritual practices. 
for you as a parent, you talked about some of the early triggers. I know that you've also got some unique ways of coaching, parenting your kids. We want to share some of them. <laughs> I was on live TV a few months ago to talk about radical parenting. And to be honest with you, Gary, I was like, is that really radical? <laughs> you know, it's like, I guess it is. Um, with the being a parent, especially a new parent, and even now, we always have to reflect, right? And in that reflection, not just with our kids, with everything, it's like, man, was that cool? Mm, no, that wasn't. I just reverted back to a child chucking a tantrum myself. I'm an adult. Was that cool? And there's stuff there, right? Uh, just as our kids mirror us, we mirror our kids because they mirrored us. It's like, well, wait, somewhere along the line, my daughter is chucking a tantrum because I chucked a tantrum. That's not even cool. I got to look at me, not look at her. And that first part of saying, what part did I play in this? Whoa. You know, especially when our businesses don't work out, our relationships don't work. What is our level of consciousness at? Is your business consistently struggling? What's the level of consciousness of the owners? Because people don't have business problems. They have personal problems that reflect in our business. Again, I talk from direct experience. But understanding to constantly ask that question, was that cool how you showed up? Are you happy if you continue to show up that way? If so, knock yourself out, but you're either going to die of a heart attack, a brain aneurysm, or some sort of a long growth process that will manifest somehow later on in life. And if longevity of life, longevity of relationships, sustainability of all that is, is a major priority, maybe we should look at the way we do things. Maybe we should look at the way we show up because spirituality for myself is all about self-mastery about emotional mastery, about not being bothered by stuff. And we will always be triggered, right? We're both entrepreneurs. We're both parents. We live in this, as soon as you leave the house, you're going to be triggered. The trick is how will you get yourself back into homeostasis? What will you do? What skills will you access um, to get you back in, to get you back into regulation? And that all came about because of you know, us losing our shit as parents. It's like, that is not cool, <laughs> you know? So what a beautiful platform to show us who we don't want to be and who went, I'm not this person. All right, what am I going to do about that? As for the radical parenting, I believe that it is our job to create an environment where our children become sovereign, to become independent and understanding that both my children are very different. My son is all about mastery. He's currently in his room learning knitting, knitting while learning French. <laughs> you know, he, he knits, uh, is a, you know, he came home from school the other day with his earpods. I said, what are you listening to, dude? And he goes, oh, a podcast. I said, what podcast? He goes, knitting. I said, who knew that there were knitting podcasts? Uh, so he's, he needs to have that tangible as well as the intellectual. Whereas my daughter is completely, has incredible social intelligence intelligence, physical intelligence, and that's where the hidden order is, right? Of course, there's going to be opposites. Of course, I'm the opposite of my daughter. Of course, my daughter's the opposite of my son. But whatever it is to understand, to hold them in that space, and from direct experience for myself, it may not be everyone else's jam, but I believe that it is child abuse if we are helicopter parents, if we are parents who protect our children and molly colder them and wrap them in so much cotton wool that they feel no pain, they feel no hardship, because that's not life. Um, you know, I've spoken to adults who live with their adult kids. <laughs> I say, mm, you might want to look at that. That's a form of child abuse, you know. <laughs> you have a three 30-year-old people who still live under your care. What's that about? And so, you know, part of the radical parenting is to evolve our children so that they can hold their own in life, so that they can fight their own fights, so that they can sustain themselves, teach them life skills, teach them how to properly put together a proposal if they want anything. And that's not a business proposal. That's a mental proposal. You want something, mate, here are the weapons of influence because the effect we have on others is the most valuable currency we have, right? Um, that's one of my radical parenting philosophies. Do you believe in life path and numerology and karmic lessons and stuff like that? I do. For myself, I practice that. It makes sense for me. On a most fundamental level, someone asked me 
a few months ago, oh, what did you do today? And I said, is that a legitimate question? You really want to know what I did today? Or is that just a shooting the breeze question? And because I'd never met him before. And he said, no, no, what did you do today? And I said, well, I held a quantum healing session at six o'clock. There's 10 of us and we go into quantum and we heal one another, uh, heal the world. We cut cords, perform miracles. So time and time and time again. And then I told him how many sessions I did that day with groups of 20 or one-on-ones. And he's like, I I don't understand it. And I said, that's okay. You're challenging my beliefs. Mate, I haven't even raised my voice. (laughs) You just, I haven't even said anything to you. You asked me simply, what did you do today? And I asked you, but do you really actually want to know? And uh, I said, if you don't believe it, that's okay too. Uh, I'm not here to, you know, spirituality is not about um, that sense of, you know, you must, it's like, no, 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 no. This is me telling you what I do. Should you want to know more? I'm happy to tell you more if you legitimately want to know more. Otherwise I have no desire, mate, to change anything that you are where you are so that you are where you are. And he got really upset, Gary. He got really upset because I challenged his beliefs purely by telling him what I do. So that challenge belongs to you, mate. There is no, I'm not even attached to you to even expend any energy. And thanks for asking, by the way, but I'm, dude, I'm not challenged and you're not challenged. Um, So those are the reasons why I don't say, you know, my astrology is, or, (laughs) you know, my karma is because people don't get it until you meet people who get it. Yeah. I ask because I guess rather than looking at my kids skill set whether they should be an accountant a doctor i look at their life path their destiny numbers their gene keys and then all sort of things to see like how do i best support them like are they going to be healers or should i give them like exposure in this field or are they going to be a certain other craft so that i was just curious of whether like you even bother looking into that or you just basically just be present in the moment and just react on or just be in flow of what they need at that moment For myself, I absolutely look into those things for my own path. For example, currently my daughter would be like, oh, I'm not that spiritual shit, stop. (laughs) And she is at this stage now where it's all um, rejecting what I know because this is what her astrology says that when she's currently in this state of chaos, in this state of Rahu, when she reaches 22, 23, this is when she's going to come to me and say, hey, mom, can I have some of that, please? Yeah. You know, and so that is me knowing that I'm not going to enforce that on her. I'm not even going to tell her that because however she needs to evolve is however she needs to evolve. And things may change, but if I have looked into that for myself and she's a part of that involvement, that's where I can assist rather than enforcing this. What what for? They don't get it. They they, they don't understand it. I guess we can influence, but we can't make them be a part of it. I think both your child is extremely gifted and unique and special. Um, I'm sure that both of them came here with a special purpose, just, I guess, the rest of us as well. But in particular, you mentioned something about um, Jeffro in, in a passing conversation, your son, about remembering the past lives of where he came from, or at least it just came out. Like, can you share a bit more about his uniqueness? And especially since you've walked this path as a spiritual entrepreneur, as someone that hasn't walked it, yeah, whatever. Like, you just dismiss it. But if they remember in past life stories or have premonitions, you're a lot more sensitive to it. And so, yeah. Uh, that's right. Um, we're not here to force things down people's throats. What for? You know, and especially when we start to talk about soul lives and, and all that stuff. So um, my son is on the Enneagram. He'd be the type five, the quite specialist, the researcher, almost that geeky nerd who needs to know stuff about stuff. And I was on a, a spiritual quest with my shaman a few years ago. We went for me to upload information in order to download it later and we took 14 flights in two weeks chasing portals chasing vortexes it was so exhausting for me because i you know we went to um, machu picchu cusco patagonia and i was just uploading this information and uh, i started speaking in tongue sometimes 
if you don't mind, like I want to delve in, what is upload? I have not heard of uploading information before. Uh, so the experience is um, my shaman and I are very close. She's assisted my acceleration a great deal. And it was my family with herself and two of her friends. And it was a very special at this time, especially where the energetics were. And with anyone to look at the itinerary would think that we were mad <laughs> because it just didn't make sense. It made sense to her, uh, according to her charts. And so I was purely there to be guided. That's why her thing was, um, you don't need to make sense of it. I just want you to experience it. So this happened in multiple locations and I would feel the surge in my body. Everyone would leave, as in my family and the others would leave, and it will be just her and I. And we would go quantum. I would do the breath work. We both got into trance. When we can get into trance, we are more suggestible to information. And she would tap open the vortex. And from that vortex, information will come out that activates dormant DNA in myself. And we're, it's all there, right? It's a case of whether we want to accelerate the activation or not, if we want to go seeking or not. And so with this surge of power, and you know, like, you know, it's like when you touch the ground and it goes through your body. And with the guidance of my shaman, this surge of power will come out from this vortex that she has tapped open and tears would come out tears tears it's the tears of remembrance i've been here before they are welcoming me home and we're talking about not only um spirits uh, we're also talking about um, extraterrestrials we're talking about a whole lot of multiple multiple dimensions as she's opening up the vortex and as this charge of energy is charging through my body, I am shaking and I'm convulsing. My eyes are rolling everywhere and I start to speak in tongue. The way that I would describe it is a cross between ET alien speak with like ancient Chinese something or another. It's like that. And it would just come out and come out like completely freak my daughter out and not so much my son. He also experiences this. And, you know, Marcella, what is this? And she's just said, you just take it up. Just take it. This is going to be something very important for you. You don't need to make sense of it. And so in all the areas, that was what I was taking up, you know, all across South America. And then when I came back to Australia, the download was the way of the spiritual entrepreneur. Wow. It was literally. <laughs> wow. And that's when it came out. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I remember like, again, early on in my awakening journey, I started like just writing out different frameworks for business or life or relationship. And it's not my passion. I have no thoughts of ever doing that. And it just downloaded. And so I get the feelings and a lot of the greatest inventors and creators, they attribute their success to not coming out from the ego self, but it's just downloaded information. So, wow, what a journey. From other dimensions. Yeah. other dimensions yeah and that's you know some people say i need to see it to believe it just as this guy was saying that you challenge my beliefs I'm like no man that's cool carry on you know um when we start to believe it we can see and experience so many many things mm, wow so what do you think you're here to accomplish in this lifetime so many things uh i believe that big part of why i'm here and again because i have done past life stuff I've spoken to numerous practitioners who all have the same story. They, they don't know each other. They all have the same story because there's a higher intelligence speaking to them um, as well as to myself. Um, my biggest mission for Pauline Wynn or whatever my real name is, <laughs> um, to be here to be the heretic. And I'm not afraid to be the heretic. To be the heretic so that the people who are ready become their own archetype and not to follow anyone else's well-written, well-recorded archetype. And it was, um, I'm here to be their heretic so that you can create your own archetype. And time and time again, I've understood that the universe rewards those who seek the truth of who they are. Mm. So I guess before I go back to business and entrepreneurship, I just want to expand on what you just touched on. 
why do you think that we came here or we created this 3D world, we created this earth and human races is here right now? Like, do you think we came here to experience certain things? And what's your um, understanding? I believe that my understanding is a very amateur understanding in the scheme of things. Holy shit. How do you answer that question? Um, I have been taught by my extraterrestrial teacher. And I will tell you that on this platform. <laughs> I know I'm challenging many people's beliefs. <laughs> um, I have a teacher who is an extraterrestrial. I've learned a lot from him and he comes to this earth and embodies energetically his daughter from DNA and the teachings come through her. And I am told that earth is a playground. Earth is like a big truck stop for other species, for other entities. And we are so young and so amateur. The things that we should be doing and we're not is so simple. Us earthlings, us human beings, we're human beings, right? We're not human doing or human done. <laughs> we're human beings is to be ourselves, to evolve into the best versions of our true self. So the seeking, the seeking is the true self, not the self society says you're meant to be, not the self that your mom and dad and whoever your teachers told you to be. It's the understanding that I get it, but that's not my true self. And so the universe will reward those who seek their true self and not be afraid of it. And we are here to evolve. We are here to push our own humanity forward, our own species forward. But the third part is we are here to do it with joy. Those are the three things that we are here to do. And I've heard that time and time and time again through my teachers and practitioners from multiple realms. We are here to evolve into the best, truest versions of ourselves. We are here to push humanity forward, our own species forward. And we are here to do it with joy. And uh, an earth is a, uh, a truck stop, a playground for all these other uh, species and entities here to come and have some fun. Can you describe what was your journey like as an entrepreneur or the version of your entrepreneur prior to the awakening journey, especially before you started writing the way of the spiritual entrepreneur? How have that shifted since you got deeper into this um, or you became higher conscious of who you are? I think what I was saying before, Gary, of when, wait a minute, this isn't working. It doesn't make sense. That constant questioning uh, rather than accepting, you know, how is it that entrepreneurship is a pissing contest? How does that make sense? <laughs> you know, what is it? And, and I say this because, again, I used to be like that. You know, growing up, you know, starting work at such a young age, it was the harder you work, the more successful you are. I was like, wait a minute, mom and dad you guys work really hard, but I don't know where the money is. You know, I don't see where your joy is. I don't see where quality of life or quality of character is. So that part doesn't make sense. You know, it's the ability to constantly question. And then um, I lived in Europe for five years or so and experienced a business again. And it's like, oh, so many things don't make sense. Why are you guys all coming to work and bitching about life and bitching about one another and complaining? Why is that the norm? Why is complaining the norm? And then starting our own business and go, man, we are working so hard. This cannot be the solution. There's got to be a better way than this. And then experiencing so many other stories, especially with entrepreneurs and bosses. You know, I was the first one to come to work and I was the last one to leave and I work harder than all my employees. And it's like, well, then you're overpaying them. There's so many things don't make sense. You know, why are we looking at elsewhere? Why are we looking at the competition? Why aren't you looking internally and evolving from the inside? So there were all these constant questions, you see, Gary, and then really grasping what is the pain? The pain here is lack of joy. The pain here is lack of inner peace. The pain here is everyone taking themselves so fucking seriously, you know, <laughs> come on, be more playful, have some fun. Cause, and then this is what my spirituality is all about. It's about remaining in spirit and inspired in spirit and inspired because then we raise our vibration, we raise our frequency and we do the somatic, somatic and soulmatic work 
to get closer to the frequency and vibration of that which we want and desire in this world. And life just becomes so much more fun and so much easier as we ascend, as we transcend, and we're not get hijacked by all this shit that weighs us down. And as I'm coaching more entrepreneurs, I'm hearing the same stories. So wait a minute, there's a pattern here. You don't really have a business problem. You have a personal problem that reflects in your business. And, you know, there were, it was a good chunk of time when, you know, my businesses was struggling as well. It's like, whoa, okay, what is your consciousness? Where is your consciousness at? And I understood that the consciousness of the business, it's called an entity for a reason, right? We mark our businesses as entities. It's forever molding, forever evolving. And how many people are unaware that the entity itself also needs spiritual work? The entity itself also needs a consciousness and a developmental stage. What stage of development consciously is your business at? And it's a direct reflection of the consciousness of the owner. And so with all these correlations, and so we get to work on the owner, Right. So that's why I say I'm not a quick fix business coach because that would just really bore me, you know, get someone else to do that. Let's work on the owner. Let's work on the leader. And the ultimate outcome is quality of life, quality of character. And that, you know, I think the happiness industry has a lot to answer for. You know, there's none of this love and light bullshit. It is, you know, dark and shade, night and dark. And it's, you know, happiness alone is not such a powerful trait. That ain't going to solve your business problems, mate. But how can we get empowered and sovereign so that when we are triggered and there will be a gazillion triggers because we're not some monks living on you know a mountain eating lentils and praying all day we are living in this 3d world so how then can we understand and know the tools so that when something happens we are fearless not without fear, but fear less, understanding how fear works. How can we be stressless, stress-free, understanding how stress works? And so this is all the science then, right? But then how can we redesign ourselves and know ourselves so deeply that we cannot be easily hacked, that we can become unshakable in the face of any adversity? So I'm not a big fan of all this happiness talk, you know? Um, we are meant to experience the full gamut of emotions. That's what we are here to do. And this comes with the whole integration part. But when we're talking about fearlessness, stress-freeness, unshakability, those are much more powerful traits in business and in life and in entrepreneurship. Yeah. And I think like when I go back to some of my values was challenging when I first met you is it was all about happiness. If you could remember like wearing the- You were the happiness king. <laughs> yes. And-, and- <laughs> and you didn't prioritize it. It wasn't as high in the priority list. Now I understand it. Not just from what you've said, but from my own experiences, life is not just about happiness. Like even when you watch a movie and there's a sad moment, there's perfection in that. But when you try to make it less than happy, happiness is the be on the end all. You, you're fading all these other emotions and you'll probably get trapped in your body somewhere. And until yeah. you start to meet it, understand it and love it, it'll show up in one form or another. And even be proud of it. Mm. You know, there was one gentleman when I released the book, uh, The Way of the Spiritual Entrepreneur, and he approached my friend, one of my collaborators, he said, I want to meet Pauline. And so he came to the restaurant and we had a meal together. And he's like, you know, I've got all these charity dinners. I'd love to hold at Red Lantern. I'm like, sure, man, I won't be talking to the charities. I'll be doing everything Red Lantern. Okay. You know, got that. Sure. And then he requested a Facebook friendship and got on my Instagram and got on my Facebook. And he couldn't handle the fact that I'm sexual or hypersexual. He couldn't handle the fact that I don't talk about love and light. And he's like, no, I can't possibly, you know, recommend my charity dinners to Red Lantern because she's not the person I expected her to be. And it's like, yeah, who set those expectations? <laughs> those expectations were yours, right? <laughs> you own them now. <laughs> and uh, it's that um, I'm totally okay with people not being okay. And so when we get closer to the truth of who we are and proud of our truth, and then we can become the heretic to uh, assist others to not be ashamed of their humanness. Mm. So um, Pete, if you were to go back in time, maybe like 20 or 30 years, 
and you get an opportunity to speak to your old self, what would you say to the younger version of you? Play more, P. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be magical. Don't cry all the time. Everything's going to be magical. And then they ask, how do I not? (laughs) Because I'm telling you, so trust me. (laughs) (laughs) I'm new. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for your time of being on this podcast and all your wisdom. Oh, one other thing I wanted to ask you, apart from your two books, which I'm going to put the links on the show notes on how to get the book. Are there any other books that you will recommend for people that's on this awakening journey that's really touch you or that it could be helpful for them? Well, um, how about the book that I just told you about my friend, um, yes. The Three Mind Revolution by David Chim. It's a beautiful book because especially for your audience who are, well, we're a particular ilk of people, right? To be able to be on this thing, onto your platform and all that you do, Gary, um, understanding that, you know, there is a thing called the champion mind. There's an actual thing (laughs) and to be proud of it and the creative mind, the learning mind. Yeah. So David Chiam, Brian Caswell, a lot of the research is by Professor Alan Snyder, The Three Mind Revolution. Nice. I will get up and I'll share the link. Thank you so much. Deep gratitude and appreciation of your time and all your wisdom. Continue kicking ass, continue to sharing your wisdom with the whole world and just leading by example. And I'm proud of <laughs> to know you as a friend and, and going on this journey together with you. Gary, it has been my joy. And as I say, every single year, it drives my friends crazy. I've only just got started. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, my friend. Thank you. Bye-bye.